Palm Sunday. We come to one of the most important weeks that Christians celebrate every year. It's the Sunday before Easter, Palm Sunday. This is Holy Week. Many years ago, today, Jesus arrived in Jerusalem to publicly announce he was the Messiah, to die on the cross for the sins of the world, and to be raised from the dead. This was an emotionally charged week for Jesus, full of highs and lows. He had heated debates with the religious leaders. He had long, meaningful conversations with his disciples. They shared a final meal. He was betrayed by a so-called friend and denied by a true friend. He was abandoned, experienced excruciating pain, and died. But that's not the final word. Next Sunday, we celebrate. We celebrate resurrection. Because all of human history pivots on this week. Everything changes. Resurrection is the reason we live. It is literally everything. And it's the reason that one day we will live in a place with no more death and mourning and crying and pain. But to understand what happened on that first Palm Sunday, we need to pick up the story a bit earlier. We need to rewind to a time when Jesus first said, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. One of the main themes in Luke's gospel is this journey to Jerusalem. In Luke 9.51, it begins, and it doesn't end until Luke 19. It's not really a travel itinerary because it, Jesus comes to the vicinity of Jerusalem earlier and, and then returns, but it's almost like a divine destiny. He's saying, I need to go to Jerusalem to accomplish the will of the Father. That's really what he's saying. Sin has separated us from the God who created us and loves us. And the only way to break the power of sin and the hold of Satan is for a perfect Savior to die in our place, be raised from the dead, and then to offer us the life he has secured as a gift. That's why he had to go to Jerusalem. And on Palm Sunday, Sunday he enters the city. In Luke 9... Jesus predicts twice that he would die and be raised. And I have a lot of scriptures this morning I'm just going to read. I'm not going to put all of them up here. But I just want to let you hear some of what Jesus said about what he was doing. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the religious leaders, be killed, and on the third day be raised. And then later, he says in Luke 9, they were amazed at the greatness of God. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man will be delivered over to human hands. But they didn't understand what he was talking about. They didn't grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him. Then the story skips to Luke 18. He gets near Jerusalem, and for a third time, he predicts, I'm going to die. Scripture says he took the 12 aside and told them, we're going up to Jerusalem, and everything written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and insult him and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again, and the disciples didn't understand any of this. So they traveled from Galilee in the north to Judea and Jerusalem in the south. And a typical journey would sort of look like this. Wherever you were, and the sea, see the Sea of Galilee up, up north, and you would move to the Jordan River Valley, and that would be your highway, and then you would come to Jericho, and you would begin this 
Long journey uphill. Look at the elevation. Sea level is the blue line. Jericho is 700 and some odd feet below sea level. Jerusalem, about 2,300 or 400 feet above sea level. So when you go up to Jerusalem, you literally go up to Jerusalem. It's about 14 miles to make that journey. And this is what the path would have looked like. We're not talking super highways here. This is a kind of a dry riverbed. Sometimes they walked on the ridges, sometimes in these dry riverbeds called wadis. And Jesus made this journey multiple times. But on this week, he had, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led, led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he just shouted even louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. It's pretty basic. Jesus said, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus. It's a long uphill walk. This guy probably didn't mind, did he? Praising God. When all the people saw it, they praised God too. In Mark's gospel, it tells us he threw away his cloak and came to Jesus. It might come in handy a little bit later in our, in our story. So this blind beggar gets it. And then also Zacchaeus gets it, this much despised tax collector that we've heard about our whole lives. In Luke 19, you can hear the story. He, he comes into Jericho. He's passing through, and there's, there's this short guy that really wants to see Jesus, but he can't because of the crowd, so he climbs up into a sycamore fig tree, and Jesus spots him, and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to go to your house. Zacchaeus welcomed him. Everyone said, look, he's going to the house of a sinner. Jesus basically said, yes, I am. That's what I do. And Zacchaeus said, Lord, I'm going to give half of everything I own to the poor. If I've cheated anybody, I'll pay them back four times the amount. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. When Jesus begins to affect your pocketbook, you know you've changed. This man, too, is a son of Abraham. He says about Zacchaeus, for the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. And Zacchaeus was lost. So the disciples are really struggling to understand what Jesus is doing. And a blind beggar sees Jesus. And a corrupt man repents and gets into the kingdom. He finally comes to Jerusalem in Luke 19, 28. He approached Bethphage, which is a little town close to the top of the Mount of Olives, and then Bethany, a little bit farther down the hill. He said to his couple of his disciples, go into the village. You're going to find a colt there. No one's ever ridden it. Bring it back. If the owner says, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it. I assume Jesus returned the colt. Um, and this happened, and so they brought to Jesus this Colt, and they put their cloaks on the coat, and Jesus began to ride it. I want you to see the Mount of Olives. We start with just some olive trees, and these have been on this, this hill for a very long time. Um, some of them are quite old, and you can tell by just the the width of this trunk, that this, this is a super old tree, hundreds and hundreds of years old. Um, some would say that, that these go back to the time of Jesus. I think a lot of people doubt that, but you're looking at maybe a thousand-year-old tree. It's pretty old. So it's in this kind of setting that Jesus would have prayed, Garden of Gethsemane, and it's through this grove, there was a path, and this would have been the descent of the Mount of Olives. And you see to your right, how it slopes down to your left. That's the Mount of Olives sloping down toward the Temple Mount. And then this would be the path, <clears throat> not the path, but it's 
pretty steep. It wasn't paved, of course. So just this dirt path descending down the mountain. In the Old Testament, <clears throat> the Mount of Olives was, was known as the place from Zechariah 14. And after his resurrection, Jesus ascends to heaven from where? Mount of Olives. And everyone knew that Messiah would enter Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. And when Jesus does that, the crowds are just ecstatic. Um, but notice Jesus enters on a donkey. I don't think they expected this. But again, fulfilling Zechariah, which says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, say to daughter Zion, Jerusalem, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I think they probably missed that. I think they thought when Messiah comes, he's going to be riding this, you know, a mighty stallion like a Roman general. How ironic that the triumphal entry is already sending this powerful message that Jesus' way of conquering sin and death and Satan will be through humility and sacrifice, not military power. And then we come to Luke 19, 36, and look what the scripture says. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. He came near to the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And, and what's the one miracle that everyone's talking about now? Lazarus being raised from the dead. He lived in Bethany, one of these little towns. You don't raise someone from the dead and keep it a secret. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They didn't, they didn't like what was going on. And Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the stones are going to cry out. He rebukes the Pharisees. Matthew, Mark, and John tell us that the crowd shouted, Hosanna. I bet the kids are shouting Hosanna back there. It's a word that just means God save us. You see this in the Psalms, like Psalm 118. Luke doesn't have Hosanna because he's not picking up this really Jewish word. He's writing to Gentiles, non-Jews. He just puts it in plain language. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices. That equals Hosanna. Now, at this time, the population of Jerusalem during Passover would just grow tremendously. So there are people camped out on the Mount of Olives, and, and you know, this, 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 this miracle of raising Lazarus not too long ago has really made the religious leaders nervous. They keep quiet. The stones are going to cry out. So Jesus just says, you know, you guys can just have your little selfish party over here. I'm going to enjoy this moment. And he descends the Mount of Olives to cries of praise. Notice what the crowd does. You know, we call this Palm Sunday. We've got little palm branches hanging. We've called it Palm Sunday for a very long time. Matthew and Mark mention that the crowds cut tree branches. Only John says they were palm branches. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of them say that the people spread their cloaks. I think we should call this cloak Sunday. It's mentioned a lot more than palms. A cloak was your was your coat. It was your outer garment. You would have a tunic like your shirt, but you would, you would wear a cloak. They were rectangular, and you would just drape it around your body. A lot of different fabrics were used. John the Baptist had a, a cloak of camel hair. Like, like he's the, <laughs> you know, he, he's the guy that wears the, the camo. That's John the Baptist, camo cloak. 
Others were woven of various colors and patterns, and men and women gen generally had coats, uh, cloaks of different colors, and sometimes they had colorful trim on them. But you guys, a cloak symbolized status and importance. Remember when the prodigal son comes home, what does the father do? He puts his cloak on him, his cloak, on his rebellious son who had come home. This was your blanket at night. Basically, your cloak was your most valuable possession. Maybe tied with your donkey, you know, but your cloak. So now you're, you've got Jesus in this crowd riding, you know, Jesus on the donkey, and they're coming down the Mount of Olives, and you see people laying their most precious possession on the ground. I mean, you would have to believe in the cause just a little bit to do that. They're honoring the king. They're getting their cloak filthy because praise is costly. They're giving up their cloak for the sake of the king. It's a privilege. It's an act of praise. I want you guys to imagine that you're, you're lining that path. You're about halfway down. You see Jesus coming down the Mount of Olives toward you. And up ahead of you, you see people taking off their cloaks, laying them on the ground for the king to walk on. You start thinking about your cloak. You know, this took a long time to weave. <laughs> a long time. It cost me a lot of money. I love it. It keeps me warm at night. You think about how hard it is to wash. And Jesus is getting closer, and you've got this decision to make. You see these people laying down their cloaks. Will you lay down your cloak for the king? Will you give up your most precious possession in order to praise Jesus? In a moment, we're going to take communion, or we celebrate the death of Jesus body, the blood, the bread and the cup. And you'll have an opportunity in this basket to just pick up a little fabric square, crimson. The color could represent for you what Jesus has done for you on the cross. I actually did this a long time ago. I've been carrying mine with me. It's it's kind of dirty and worn and not nearly as pretty as these. It kind of goes with me wherever I go. But you'll have a chance to do that. And the little square represents your cloak. Whatever you think this symbolizes in your life. It could be something like a house or, or a car or clothes or, or a job could be your position, your, your rank, your role, prestige. Could be a hobby, something you do in your leisure time that you love. Could be your money. It's not just a piece of fabric in a church service, and you don't, certainly don't have to take one. It stands for something, something real in your life. And I would ask you to carry it with you, maybe in your wallet or your purse or your backpack. Um, let it travel with you. And let the Spirit help you understand what this symbolizes. What does it stand for? What does your cloak represent? And then as you leave on this cloak Sunday, this little piece of crimson cloth will go with you. And reminds you that Jesus deserves our highest praise. Not just for an hour on Sunday, as much as we love this, but through our whole life. I love what the Apostle Paul said, Romans 12. Look at this. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies, your lives, your whole selves to God because of all that he has done for you, the crimson. 
Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, and it's going to be good. It's going to be pleasing. It's going to be perfect. Many times in what we've read this morning from Luke's gospel, and I count at least five of these, we're told the original disciples didn't get it. They didn't understand why would the conqueror need to go die. Makes no sense. After the resurrection, they got it. He wasn't going to stay dead. We don't know a lot about resurrection. But we've had more than 2,000 years to get it. We understand what Jesus was doing. We celebrate the Lord's Supper. We celebrate resurrection. But as we come together on this Palm Sunday to begin Passion Week, here's the question for us. What will we do with the crimson fabric? What will we do with all that God has given us? We don't sit out here devoid of blessings. We sit out here covered in them. with our abilities and our talents and our possessions and our gifts and our time and our money. We sometimes feel good about coming here for an hour. I think God wants our whole life. Many of these disciples, they took their cloak and they they placed it in the road. Think about this as we finish. And it was walked on by at least one donkey (laughs) and a whole bunch of people as they filled in the gaps behind Jesus and escorted him down that hill. I think maybe after the whole thing was done, they went back and tried to find that cloak, don't you? They retrieved it, but it was different. It was dirty. It may have been a little torn. It was scarred. If you choose to praise and honor Jesus with all that he has given you, with your cloak, it's going to get dirty and it's going to get messy and it's going to get complicated. And sometimes you just think it would be so much easier not to be a Christian. But what an amazing privilege to use what he's given you to praise him. That's why we were made. That's what we were meant to do. If you keep it to yourself, you can fold it. It'll be nice and neat. No dirt, no mess. But something about it will be wasting away. I I wonder if a cloak wasn't just made to keep you warm. And, And... you know, to serve you in so many ways. I wonder if the cloak was made to be laid down. Is this, is this the purpose of the cloak, really? Your life won't be an instrument of praise if it's just nicely folded, placed on the shelf, protected, safe. But if you want to shout Hosanna on this Palm Sunday, if you want to lay down this cloak, you're going to be different. You're going to get a little dirty and a little worn, but it's going to be so worth it. Nothing will compare. You will really live. Hosanna. Let's pray. Lord, in a moment, we're going to take communion, and I would ask the, those who are help, going to help with that to come on up. And as we take the bread, we can line up along the outside, beginning with the first rows, and and then come back up through the the middle aisle. As we take communion, Lord, we take the bread and dip it in the cup and then eat it. We are reminded of all that you have done for us. See, worship is a response. 
never comes out of thin air, never, never something we work up or create or manufacture. It's always a response. So by taking communion, we're reminded of what you've done for us. You gave your life. We could have died, but it wouldn't have done any good. You, the Messiah, the perfect one, the sinless one, had to die in our place. And Lord, as you did that, and then as you were raised from the death, the power of death was broken. The power of Satan was completely destroyed. You've given us life. And it, as we take that, then we walk a little further. And we're invited to take the crimson fabric, which represents everything that we would give back to you in worship. Everything we would lay down, Lord. And we're gonna carry that with us because it's a symbol, but it's our choices. It's our priorities. It's our decisions, it's our relationships, it's our commitments. Those are gonna be the ways that we lay down our cloak in praise of you. May we follow you with our whole hearts, Lord, in praise on this Cloak Sunday. In your name.